Honourable Secretary, fellows and guests, um, Andrew and I would like to thank you and the Society for the invitation to speak this evening. We thought rather than boxing and coxing continually uh, swapping places, it would make sense if I gave a brief introduction to the project and then Andrew will take over and talk about the detail. Our story today begins with a major infrastructural project. This was undertaken in 2010 as a joint, as a an Oxford Wessex Archaeology joint venture to investigate archaeological remains in advance of Phase 2, glamorously called Phase 2 of the East Kent Access Road, linking the former island of Thanet with points south via the Epsilon Peninsula. Amongst the rich multi period remains revealed by a series of excavations covering nearly 50 hectares along the 6.5 kilometre route of the Access Road was a substantial late Iron Age ditch protecting the strategically important Epsilon Peninsula and Pegwell Bay on the channel side of it. The ditch postdated a late Middle Iron Age settlement, but equally clearly predated the first century AD, whilst associated finds included possible Roman militaria, whose significant was re- significance was recognised by Andrew, who was part of the project team for the joint venture. The obvious possibility that the ditch and finds were somehow connected by chronology to Julius Caesar's invasions of Britain in 55 and 54 BC led Andrew, who by then had left Wessex archaeology, to approach me with the suggestion that the time was right for a new research project on the archaeology of Julius Caesar's invasions that would include, but not be restricted to, further work to confirm the status of the Epsfleet site. Now, as many of you here will know, the last definitive study of Julius Caesar's invasion of Britain was over a century ago by Thomas Rice Holmes. Indeed, the topic was last seriously revisited by Christopher Hawkes in the fifth Mortimer Wheeler Archaeological Lecture, which I was lucky enough to attend as a young research student aspiring to a career in archaeology. So you can tell that was a long time ago as well. <laughs> During the last 40 years, much potentially relevant new evidence has come to light, not least by the Portal Antiquities Scheme, with Ed's Ebsfleet, if you like, just the latest and most compelling element in, in a case that's building up. Andrew's idea for a new research project on Julius Caesar was for me a no-brainer. After all, I do work in a department with a particular interest in the archaeology of famous Shakespearean characters. More seriously, this was also a kind of a, a way in to a wide ranging archaeological reappraisal of the many important changes that took place in southeast England between Julius Caesar's brief visits and the Claudian conquest a century later, for which they laid the foundation. And the key point, obviously, in seeking funding is you have to have something that will excite and interest the funders. In 2013, Andrew and I put together an application to the Leverhulme Trust for funding for a four-year project, and this was successful. Our research began in earnest in October 2014 and is now in the final year. It's brief, as I indicated, to look not only for archaeological evidence of Caesar's invasions and their enduring impact on the peoples of South East England, a topic I may say not without residence today, with a year to go of all days, but also a project that would aim to set this episode within the wider archaeological and historical context of Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul. Because of the interest that the discoveries of Ebb's feet have aroused in the media, we will devote a substantial amount of today's lecture to the site. But we are also working on a monograph which is going to take a much wider perspective on the late Iron Age in South East England, which we are hoping to have finished by the end of the year. At this point, I'll hand over to Andrew to take up the story. But we'll move from the southeast of England to the much wider context in which Julius Caesar's invasions need to be understood. And it's within Rome and within within the Roman conception of the world. And here is a representation of how in about the first century BC, Romans would have described the world were they to have made maps of it, but they didn't. They didn't make maps, and that's an important point which we'll come back to. 
But the Romans conceive of the world essentially as circular and it is surrounded by an outer sea. Some places are known to lie beyond the outer sea, one of which is Britain. And it is this, this remoteness, the interest in a land that lies beyond the known world, that ultimately leads to Caesar's invasions and then to the Claudian invasion almost a century later. But in order to understand why Caesar came to Britain twice in 55 and 54 BC, we need to understand a little of the contemporary political context in Rome. And Rome has a form of democracy at this stage. If you happen to be male and have to be very rich, you can participate in it. And each year, two men are elected to be the supreme leaders, the consuls for each year. And this democracy is not very democratic in reality. And a great deal of corruption, bribery, physical violence goes on to secure power. And by the 60s BC, we see the rise of what is known as the triumvirate, the three figures you can see before you. Julius Caesar is one, but he, along with Crassus and Pompey, Pompey the Great, come to an arrangement where they keep each other in power and ensure that they are elected to the highest position, the consulship. And it is understood, widely accepted within Roman society, that in the year following a consulship, the consuls will be granted a provincial command in which, as governors, they have an opportunity to make their name even further, but also to accrue great wealth, typically in the context of warfare. And this is seen by Roman society at the time to be entirely a good thing to bring more people under the sway of Roman authority. And it's within the relationship particular between Caesar and Pompey that I will argue that we should understand why Caesar comes to Britain. Crassus is the wealthiest man in Rome, and he and Pompey have served together as consuls in the past, and they are rivals. But Crassus is not a great general, he is a successful general, but his ambitions are quite modest. In contrast, Pompey deliberately models himself on Alexander the Great, and he seeks to conquer the known world. And it's in this conquest of the known world that Caesar takes his cue. Now, most of what we know about Julius Caesar's invasions of Britain come from his descriptions in his commentaries on the battle for Gaul. And from those commentaries, we have a very popular image of Caesar as a general and also as an astute politician. But that misses a lot of things about the man. He is regarded as one of the most able men of his generation, <coughs> as a very fine orator, as a very fine author. But we also know, when he comes to be a dictator, that he attempts to reform the laws, to establish a library, and he reforms the calendar, which we still have today. So if we just think of Caesar as a bit of if off bash general, we miss a lot. But we miss that partly because of the modern perception that he was such a fine propagandist that we cannot believe what he says. And this is a view that has been particularly propagated in the aftermath of the two world wars. And it says that Caesar conceals his meaning. And the logic of the argument runs to the point that you can't believe anything he says, you can only believe what he doesn't say. I don't accept that. I think that's a very flawed reading. Um, we have to remember that Caesar seems remarkable because his commentaries, his own account of the wars, which are based on his annual reports to the Roman Senate, is remarkable only insofar as that it survives. The other accounts of Pompey's wars, for example, are lost. So we don't know how typical or atypical the way he presents himself is. But I just want to take one example as to why we should believe largely what he says, and that's in his army, he has the younger brother of the Roman senator Cicero. The younger brother is Quintus Cicero, and we know that letters are written between the brothers, and some of those letters survive. And so, although we must accept that Caesar puts the best possible light on events, 
I don't think we can accept that he is lying outright or should not be believed. For if he were to have done so, he would surely have been called out. But what are these events? Well, Caesar serves as consul in 59 BC, and in 58, he is awarded two provinces to look after, and they are essentially northern Italy. And as you see from this map of the Roman world at this time, it is very much a Mediterranean empire. Indeed, the parts to the east in uh, modern Turkey, largely, have only recently been added by Pompey in the 60s BC. Caesar's command is North Italy, but unfortunately, the governor for southern France, Matilde Seller, dies unexpectedly, and it's decided to add the province of Transalpine Gaul, basically southern France, to Caesar's command. And what happens very shortly after that is that the people of Switzerland, the Helvetii, seek to migrate to the west of France. They say they're doing that because of pressure from the Germans, and if they were to make their journey, they would cross the territories of allies of Rome. And that would destabilize the Roman province in the south, but it might also have other consequences. And so Caesar has a legitimate reason, as a person in charge of protecting the south of France, to take action, and he does. And essentially, he takes the opportunity to start a war. And that is the beginning of the Battle for Gaul. The defeat of the Helvetii follows very quickly, but he then runs on for almost a decade, campaigning, as you can see in this map, which looks like the introduction to Dad's army, all the way across France, into Germany, Belgium, and beyond. And at no point do the Romans in Rome say this is a bad thing. They argue about individual things, about whether they should have done that to a particular opponent, or whether Caesar's outstretched his command, but nobody says that this war is a bad thing. Everybody accepts it is a good thing to do. Now, in 55 BC, Julius Caesar does two things which are quite remarkable. The first is that he crosses the Rhine. And the Rhine is one of the boundaries to Roman knowledge. They don't know what lies beyond it, and there is tradition of German, Germanic peoples having invaded the south of France and threatened Italy. So he strikes a blow, even though it is largely a symbolic blow, against one of the great historic enemies of the Romans. And then later in the year, he crosses the sea to Britain. He crosses beyond the known world. And these are quite remarkable things to have done. But if that's the story, the broad outline, how does the archaeology begin to fill this in? Well, in France, it's well understood that there is an extensive archaeology of the Battle for Gaul, the name of Julius Caesar's commentaries. Back in the 19th century, some of the key battlefields were identified, and since then, sites have steadily come to light. And there's an important point to take from this work in France, and I give you an example from Alicia, the decisive battlefield in 52 BC, where on this map from Napoleon III's work in the 1860s, you can make out in the middle, there's a hill surrounded by red lines which the Romans besieged them. And I'm just going to highlight in the top right-hand corner an unusual enclosure. The important point about this is that it's a Roman fort. It's not the kind of Roman fort we would expect to see in Britain or on the Roman limes, but it is undoubtedly a Roman fort with the details of the defences are typically Roman defensive works and if there were any doubt, the inscribed, sorry, I've gone too far, the inscribed sling stone at the bottom, lead sling bullet, is of Caesar's lieutenant, Titus Labienus. This is the fort of Caesar's deputy in 52 BC, but you would not recognise it as a Roman fort, and that's a lesson that's important for us to bear in mind when we look for what the archaeology of Caesar in Britain might be. So... Caesar comes to Britain in 55, and he brings a very small force. I've suggested the legions may only be 3,000 here. They may have been stronger, but it's a modest force, less than 10,000. And the important point in this is the time of year at which Caesar comes, the end of summer into the early autumn. Now, he returns 
He doesn't stay. And because of that, it's very often said that Caesar's invasions were a failure. They weren't. They were never intended to be a permanent occupation. And at this time, it is simply enough for the Romans to be victorious in battle, to declare themselves as victors and to secure the triumph. You do not need to have colonialism through boots on the ground. You can execute imperialism through working with the local elites. And this is what Caesar is about. And the reason that he gives us for this invasion in 55 is that the Britons have sent support to the Gauls in all their battles against him. So he has a legitimate reason to come to Britain, but he says, almost nonchalantly, I thought it would be useful. Doesn't really elaborate why it would be useful or to whom it would be useful, but that will become clearer. The following year, he returns. And he comes from a different place. Now, in... Sorry, I've skipped. The first year, he crosses from, it is thought, near Boulogne, and traditionally it's believed he, are, he lands at Dover. And as Colin was mentioning earlier, Rice Holmes in 1907 argued that Caesar eventually landed at Deal. Um, the reason why Rice Holmes argued that Caesar landed at Dover or wanted to land at Dover was he believed there to be a harbour there. But there is no evidence for a harbour in prehistoric Dover until much later. Did he land at Deal? I think that's very unlikely. The beach there is a steeply shelving shingle beach, and it seems to me much more likely that the landing site lies further inland, probably somewhere towards Worth, which now lies on uh, maybe three kilometres from the sea, but before was much closer. But I don't want to dwell too much on 55, other than its political conquest, rather than to turn to 54. And this is a much more serious exercise. And the reason Caesar gives for this campaign is that in the winter of 55 to 54, a prince of the tribe of the Trinobantes, Mandubrachius, has fled to him in France to seek his support because the father of Mandubrachius has been killed by somebody called Cassivellaunus. And this provides a legitimate reason for Caesar to come back to Britain. It's the same reason that he uses in starting the war in Gaul initially. It is to protect the allies of Rome against the migration of the Helvetii. So it's the same narrative. They are protecting their friends. But he has a much larger force. He says five legions, at least 2,000 cavalry, and 800 ships. Now, there is a difference in the account. Caesar says in the first year, he went by the shortest crossing, which might have been Boulogne. The second year, he talks about a place called Portus Itius, which he describes as providing the most convenient crossing, and they aimed to land the place which they had learnt the year before was the best landing place. And the plan is to sail across the channel using the tide, and then to tack across the channel further with the wind. But about midnight, because they're sailing overnight, the wind drops, and they're carried too far by the tide. And at first light, they see Britain far behind them on the left-hand side. And traditionally, that has been thought to be the cliffs at Dover. And according to Rice Holmes, they returned probably to Warmer and Deal. I'm going to suggest that this is not the case. And in order to understand this a little bit more, we need to look at the topography. So here's a, a LIDAR model showing the contemporary landscape. And Collins mentions Thanet. Now, Thanet was an island, but today it isn't. Thanet has never been considered as a possible landing base simply because once it was an island. But it has many advantages. So let's just lay down some of the places we've already mentioned. Here is Deal, the site at Worth. You can see now some distance inland from the shore. Richborough, which is the traditional landing site of Claudius in AD 43. And Ramsgate, modern Ramsgate, which I'll show you a picture of soon. 
the beach at Pegwell Bay, and then Ebbsfleet itself, and an indication of the Wantsum Channel. And it is the Wantsum Channel that's reclaimed, systematically <coughs> reclaimed, by the monks from Canterbury in the Middle Ages. And so by the 13th century AD, there is very little left of the wide expanse of marsh and floodplain that was the former Wantsum Channel. I don't think it could ever been a swiftly flowing river because if it had been, it would have been impossible to reclaim so quickly and so effectively by the Middle Ages. So the topography is important in understanding this. And here we see the peninsula of Ebbsfleet in the road scheme excavations of 2010. And the peninsula is marked by the, the crops of wheat. Beyond lie reclaimed ground, and in the middle distance, the river Stour as it flows out through the, the, the eastern outflow of the former Monson Channel. Beyond is the English Channel. Now, in those excavations by Oxford Wessex Archaeology, we found a very large ditch, as Colin has mentioned. There and further away, some 500 metres apart. And, and there were two important points that struck me in the field about this. The, the first was it was very unusual to find a defence of this type at this time, because in Britain, hill forts had stopped being built almost a century earlier. And this certainly was no hill. So what was it? And then, when we looked carefully at the evidence of occupation inside it, we could find no evidence for contemporary occupation. There was an Iron Age hamlet that had stood there, but that seems to have been abandoned at the time that these ditches were built. So as part of the research project, we returned to the site and undertaken geophysical survey. And you can see in brown the sweep of the road scheme and a pipeline to the east of it. And then in the grey tone, the geophysical prospection. And all the field work in our project has been undertaken as a community archaeology project working with Kent County Council. It was clear that the site occupies somewhere in the region of 20 hectares or more. Now, we don't have the full extent. The area which the green line covers there is woodland. We've tried to survey, but we can't get the data points. And we don't have access to the lands to the east. So I'm not sure quite how we reconstruct the site, but it is a very unusual site were it to be a British site. But in the course of the research for the road scheme, I realised that the best parallels for the defences lie with the siege works at Elysia that we've seen before, dating to 52 BC, and also at the site of the Battle of Bibracti in 58 BC. So the parallels seem to be Roman rather than British, and the little image of the legionary here has by his side a couple of Roman pilum. Now at this time, they're a different style from the ones you would see in Roman Britain. And so, in this section of the ditch here, which we excavated in 2016, when we found a, a weapon head, initially we weren't sure what it was, but eventually we could compare it with the examples from Elysia again, and now more recently with a find from Hermeskeil in Germany that dates to 51 BC. We can see that this is a typical Republican pilum head. So we have certainly one Roman weapon from the defences. But we have another strand of evidence, and that is the account that Julius Caesar gives of the landing. And now, it's important to have some of the topography here. Here's Ramsgate and the chalk cliffs by it, the sandy open beach at Pegwell Bay, and here is an outline roughly of where the shore was in the 13th century, because we have a dated medieval seawall, and roughly where we think the Iron Age shoreline was. And the area enclosed by the defences lies within the ploughed field. Caesar describes how they first see Britain at first light in their journey. And he says, at sunrise, they see Britain afar on the port side. And so they follow the tide to the place that they know is the best place of disembarkation. And he, later on, he gives us another couple of clues. He says the ships are left riding at anchor on a soft, open shore. And he also says that the Britons think about opposing the landing, but retreat to the higher ground. And what we have 
at Pegwell Bay is a soft, sandy open shore, the biggest of its kind in East Kent. And importantly, we have cliffs by Ramsgate, because when you're at sea in a small boat, the curvature of the earth means you cannot see low-lying ground. And to either side of Thanet is low land or sea. The Wonsum Channel to the south, the Thames Estuary, and then Essex to the north. So the only land that Caesar can have been describing are the cliffs of Thanet. And next to Ramsgate, by those cliffs, we have the wide open shore that is consistent with a beach where you could land 800 ships in a day and disembark in the region of 20,000 soldiers and 2,000 horses. And to do that, you need a landing front of between two and three kilometers. And so Pegwell Bay fits the bill very well. It just hadn't been considered before because it was an island earlier on. So we argue that Ebsfleet is the landing base of 54. Now, the rest of the campaign is well known, that he marches <coughs> through the early hours of the following morning with most of the army to Canterbury. A battle is fought. They then have to come back to repair the ships, and defend the fort that is protecting the fleet. They then return to Canterbury. Another battle is fought. They march somewhere to around more than London, 80 miles inland to cross the Thames and eventually a decisive battle is fought in which Casimir Lornus, the warlord, is defeated. And we know that must be somewhere near the territory of the Trinobantes, who we know as the tribe that occupies modern Essex, because the Trinobantes give him food and Caesar says that he should not allow his troops to harm the Trinobantes. So the decisive battle is not far from the area of modern Essex. So one of the things we've done, and here's my colleague Al Oswald, undertaking some of the survey works that we've done on hill forts that could have been attacked, is to, using LIDAR, an old-fashioned earthwork survey, see which sites fit the bill for the sites that Caesar mentions are being attacked. Now, Bigbury, near Canterbury, has long been identified as the place well identified, well, well protected by nature and by man, if only because it's the only hill fort until Christopher Berry Green's recent discoveries that it could have been. And we think that Bigbury is still the best candidate for the site that Caesar attacks and defeats in the first battle. The last battle, many sites have been suggested, but we are arguing that it is Walbury Camp near Stansted Airport because it is well protected, same phrase, by nature and by man, but also it is protected by marshes. And so we've looked at all the hill forts and whether they are or could have been protected by marshes. And Walbury Camp, which is near the territory of the Trinobantes, is the only one that fits the bill. So we can bookend the two battles that he describes in which hill forts are taken. We can also see evidence in the coinage. And here's uh, some work from Collins from some years ago, which shows the distribution of coins that are issued in Belgic Gaul, so northern France and Belgium, perhaps in Britain too, and their distribution on both sides of the channel suggests that they have been used as payment for soldiers fighting in the wars against Caesar. And the little red circle in the diagram at the bottom shows the great increase, a threefold increase in the number of dies used to strike these coins, which are dated to the times of the war. So we have in the archaeology for a long time coins that we can attribute to that. It's a bit fuzzy though. And here are other coins that we think could fit into the campaigns and be associated with Caesar's campaigns through Britain. So here's a distribution of potent coins, tin, very high tin rich coins. And you'll see there's quite a concentration in the London area. And that is a distribution that is away from the normal pattern of site finds. So they look to have been displaced. So we think these coins, the coin hoards, might fit with Caesar's campaigns and the crossing of the Thames. But if you look at the small print, it's phase three. And then when we look at the Belgic coins, the Gallo Belgic E as they're called, they're phase four. And then you look at the British coins that copy the type before Gallo Belgic E. They're dated to a phase later, and this is work still in progress, but we think we need to rearrange the chronology of the coinage, where we will see, we are sure, 
that there is a horizon of coin hoarding that can be associated with the campaigns, but also the chronology of coin use, particularly of gold coins, can be extended <coughs> earlier than is currently seen. But what are the long-term impacts in Britain? Well, <coughs> Caesar describes how he takes hostages, the obsides, and he <coughs> decides on a tribute, the vectigalis, how much they will pay. So Caesar says that at the end of 54, he's taking hostages and defining tribute. And this is a way by which the Romans will bind in the people, in this case Britain, into the Roman world. Because if the peace is broken, those hostages will die. And those hostages always come from the family of the elite. And if the money isn't paid, they might not be happy. But this is a classic Roman formulation of how you make people beyond the Roman territory into client kings. And we think we can see some evidence of that in the well-known late Iron Age burials, the so-called Wellin type, where there's a very tight concentration in Hertfordshire, and they emerge from no background. And they have some unusual things, most notably from Wellin grave here, silver cups, which are exceptionally rare finds in Iron Age burials across Europe, and graffiti on the bottom that say that they were owned by a Roman. And we think that these may be diplomatic gifts that are given by the Romans to those people in Britain who choose to side with Caesar rather than to fight with Cassivellaunus against him. And so these are the kinds of people who may well become friends of Rome. And we can see this illustrated in the south of England with coins of Tincomarus. Now there's a king called Commius, who's a Gaul, who eventually, after swapping sides with Caesar for and then again, says he will leave as long as he never sees a Roman again. And it's often assumed that the king who issues coins in the modern counties of Hampshire and Sussex with the name Commius on it is that same man. A little later, we see coins with the name Tincomarus. This is one here. And they're in a traditional style. And then all of a sudden, the coins look absolutely Roman. And these coins imitate coins of Octavian of 29 BC. So why do the coins suddenly become Roman? And you couldn't get more Roman than the little quarter coin that goes with it, with the head of Medusa. It's really quite remarkable. Well, the explanation that has been given by John Crichton is that Tinkamaris was a client king <coughs> And he'd been sent as a hostage to Rome, and then he is returned to rule. And this is a scenario that we see with the distribution of similar coins outside the empire, all of which have the horsemen in Luxembourg, in Numidia, in Noricum. And the important <coughs> point about the example from Numidia, Juba. Juba, we know, is taken as a hostage, as a young child. He's brought up as a Roman, and then eventually returned to be seen as the king the client king of Numidia. And Crichton argues that this is what we will see with Tinkamaris. And other things will follow from this, so just briefly to touch on them. We see the emergence of Opida, the earliest towns in Britain. And we see things with rectangular buildings and regular town planning. This is new from about the 20s BC. And in places like Fishbourne and Braffing in Hertfordshire, we begin to see a full range of Roman goods, imported goods like these ones from Graves. But at Braffing, we see Roman foodstuffs, olive oil, wine, fish sauce, but also food preparation vessels, the vessels for eating and drinking, brooches in the Roman style, cosmetic jars. We begin to see a complete Roman material culture, and that includes styli. And so we get the introduction of writing, through the form of graffiti and also on coinage at these urban sites. And if there was any doubt that this complete Roman material culture package represents anything other than Romans, you need look no further than the name Gracchus on the graffiti from Braffing. We have Romans in Iron Age Britain. And rather than these arising from diplomatic contexts, contacts that are forged in campaigns in the 20s BC, we prefer to see them arising directly from the aftermath of Julius Caesar's campaigns. And ultimately, with the denouement of this is by maybe 10 BC, we can recognize at Lexington and Colchester the grave of a client king of Rome, 
where in the grave there is a complete range of Roman grave goods, a Roman couch, a Roman folding stool, Roman statuary, the dead man, if it is a man, is buried with a Roman suit of chain mail. It is a Roman burial, it is unique in Britain, it is the grave of a client king of Rome, and we would argue that these links derive from Caesar. But, in order to understand this better, we need to return to Rome. And what we've tried to do is to see how the triumph of Britain might have been represented. Now, this is an example of the hoard, a silver vessel from Boscarali near Pompeii. It's of Tiberius, the triumph of Tiberius, either 7 BC or AD 12. And this is a classic piece of Roman street theatre of ritual and popular entertainment. But in it, the successful general who's been acclaimed as a victor on the field of battle by his soldiers, the successful general dresses up as a god for a day. He wears traditional costume. And here, you can see there is a slave behind him holding a wreath above his head saying, remember, you are but a man. You can play god for a day, but you are immortal. And in front of the triumphal chariot are displayed the booty, now, often, that booty takes a form of gold rings, and in Britain, the amount of gold talks that we have surely indicates that this is the typical booty that would have returned to Rome, would have been British Iron Age talks. But we also have, on Roman coins, representations of chariots, and Caesar mentions chariot warfare only in Britain. Never once does he mention it in Gaul. So these chariots must relate to the warfare of Britain. And so presumably some chariots were actually taken back to Rome. And we have literary references in poets of people running around in their painted British chariots. So chariots as well. And there are also representations, representations of the places conquered. And Germany is represented by the River Rhine, Gaul by the River Rhone. And then there is a representation, a golden statue of the ocean. And it would seem to be that Britain is represented by a statue of the sea. Immediately in front of the triumphal chariot are the hostages, the elite family. And here's a close-up from the Temple of Polysocianus, which celebrates Octavian's victories in 29 BC. And the defeated are literally carted round on biers to be seen and jeered at by the Roman people, but eventually some of them are brought up as Romans and returned as client kings. And it's in this triumph that I think we should see the actual timing of why Caesar comes to Britain. And it's in relation to the deep rivalry and the competitiveness between the Roman elite, but particularly between Caesar and Pompey. Now, Pompey is the greatest general of his time in Rome, and he has claimed to have conquered the world. And Caesar competes with this, and he does it through a variety of means. Some of them are great public building projects. So we he see Caesar starting with his forum, for example, <coughs> while Pompey <coughs> builds the theatre of Pompey. And this is to be the first stone theatre in Rome, and it's the greatest public building work of its age. And we can see how Pompey presents himself in a coin issued in 56 BC. In it, we can see a globe in the middle, and above it, a crown, which is a golden crown that Pompey was allowed to wear because he had celebrated three triumphs. And those three triumphs are represented by the wreaths around them. And then below, on the left, there is the stern of a Roman ship, that lustre, on the right, a corn of wheat. And if we play that out as how that refers to, it sees that it's Pompey's triumphs in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, his three triumphs, the fact that he has defeated the pirates and secured the grain supply to Rome, and also his responsibility for the grain supply. And in the center is his globe, in which he is claiming to be ruler or conqueror of the world, and he will celebrate that by wearing his golden crown to the events in his theater. This is going to open in September 55 BC. 55 BC, it's a year that Caesar crosses the Rhine and he crosses the sea in August. 
to the effect that the news of his triumph will arrive in Rome just as Pompey is about to open his theatre. And that theatre will include statues of the nations that Pompey has conquered, and it will include a statue of Pompey himself holding the globe. Caesar reigns on Pompey's party. He has redefined the world, and he doesn't just do that militarily, because in his ethnography, which he gives the first descriptions of the Britons and of the Germans, he gives an intellectual element, and in his very accurate measurements of Britain and the way he uses a water clock to define the latitude of Britain, he gives it geographical information. So it's an intellectual as well as, as, well as a military conquest. And if we were any doubt about the significance, it is made by Caesar's final statement at the end of the four triumphs that he celebrates on four consecutive days in 44 BC. And in his temple, so the temple of his family, the Venus Genetorix, we know that he dedicates a cuirass, a breastplate made of British pearls. And those British pearls aren't the finest pearls. There are much better ones to be got from elsewhere, from the Indian Ocean. But Caesar wants it to be known that they come from Britain. And the point that he is making there is that he has crossed the sea and he has conquered the sea. He has gone beyond the known world. And the fact that he chooses to do that as his final act of these triumphs illustrates that his campaigns and his invasions in Britain weren't a failure. They weren't a failure because he didn't stay or he didn't conquer more. They were a success because he intended to go beyond the known world. And in doing that, he achieved the status that usurped the one that Pompey had a, tried to a, take for himself as the successor to Alexander the Great. So for Britain, Caesar's invasions have a profound effect. They draw Britain into the Roman world. And because of the contacts that develop over the next 100 years and the client kingdoms, when Claudius eventually needs a relatively easy campaign, the southeast of England is a relatively easy one for him to win. But for Rome, it's a different story. And in it, it is a story in which Caesar, with his geographical descriptions and his ethnographies, is redefining the intellectual basis of the world and extending the Roman Empire out beyond, from the Mediterranean through France and then into Britain, he has redefined the world as the Romans understood it. And that is why, in his lifetime, his campaigns to Britain are regarded as an outstanding success, not a miserable failure. And in doing this, Caesar is redefining the world that the Romans knew in his own self-image. Thank you.